podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chad Alderson. I got Nick Hanna with me. Nick, what's up? How we doing, buddy? Good. You feeling uh, better? A little. I'm, I've been sick, and I'm, uh, I could talk again, almost. <laughs> Still on the antibiotics, but we're getting through it. Well, anyway, we have on the show today um, Dan LeCount from Truckee, yep. Tahoe area. What's up, Dan? What's going on, man? Not much. I'm gonna, is I'm that gonna... French? It is. It is. So, um, yeah, they came over during the American Revolution to fight against the British, for uh, and then... But most of my family is actually Scotch and Irish. Nice. But uh, yeah, the name is French. And you, uh, you grew up in a, a town called La Honda, California. Yes, Where's sir. Where's that at, man? Um, so it's a tiny, tiny little town. Um, it's kind of on the coast out by Half Moon Bay, in between Half Moon Bay and Santa Cruz. And the uh, sign says like 500. I think it's probably closer to like 800 or 1,000 now. Oh, okay. And just killer little coastal town. The Redwoods had a little steelhead stream, a couple little bass ponds. Oh, nice. That's kind of was my... Um, my uh, introductory phase into fishing and stuff. It was it's a real cool place to grow up. So you left the coast to come up and catch trout. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, guide. You see, so you, you guide in the the Truckee <laughs> Tahoe. You um, you're involved in a bunch of uh, local watershed conservation programs that we're going to talk about a little later. Um, you're a board member on the uh, local trout TU or the the Trout Unlimited, aka TU chapter up in up in Truckee. Yeah, for sure. Um, you're a guest speaker and you, you cover mostly tactics and ethics and I'll get into that in a, in a bit. Um, you also tie for um, Umqua, Mm -hmm. uh, as a tire, you build rods, you public, you're a published author, photographer, and an artist. What don't you do? Um, how many people have you killed? Fish, I think. (laughs) In the South. Yeah, exactly. Just, just talk about fishing all the time. Don't actually get to fish. No, the, um, that's pretty good. That's the cool thing with, 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 if you have a career in fly fishing, you got to kind of market all the, as many angles that you can do, especially if you have any, you know, if you're an adept at any of them. And um, so you can eat. Pretty exactly much, or, pretty yeah. much and so like especially for me like i don't guide steelhead or do other sort of stuff in the winter time so i end up using other angles you know mm-hmm. whether it's doing you know you know program speaking or building custom fly rods or doing fly stuff you know i kind of have all these different sort of other things and diversifying my income in the winter time it just kind of makes it work more for me so you know i don't have to commute and stay a week over on the coast or something else right. or, or go and guide pyramid for four days in a row and then come back home, you know, nice. I can kind of balance out my income and stuff like that. And it works for me, you know? Well, we always, uh, the first question we always ask is you've been ripping lip lately. Uh, I- yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I did a couple, I had a client that came in, uh, this last weekend and took him out for a few days and, uh, it was fun, man. Um, we went out on the, uh, on the little truckie and we had a, uh, killer little, the first day Saturday was epic cause we had high cloud cover. And so there were like blue wings, mm. there were little winter stones. We were getting sight fishing with dry flies the whole when, nine. It was dude, pretty awesome. When, when there's a hatch going on there, that's one of the best dry fly spots in California. I think it's rad. It's, it's rad. Awesome. It gets crowded, but you know, right now, uh, midwinter, it's not as bad. You know, it, it takes a little more effort to get out there cause the snow and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it, it can be quiet, you know, weekends aren't as quiet, but you go out there on a weekday, it's, it's really quiet. And, um, you know, you gotta have four wheel drive and stuff to do it, but you know, it's fun. But anyways, the second day was super high clear and it was a lot tougher, you mm-hmm. know, whether or not you had cloud cover was a big difference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we went from getting maybe 10 plus shots of fish the first day to having two shots of mm. fish the second day. And, uh, we really had to work hard, but the best fish we got was actually on the second day. He got like a 
20, 20, 20, 22 inch rainbow that was just epic. Isn't that kind of cool funny? You, you pull up to a spot and you're in a bunch of cars. You're like, ah, oh, but really, it's if there's not clouds in the sky, that's that's your enemy. You yeah, know? it's like it's funny to yeah. you think that way. Yeah, yeah and, and it, it kind of depends on what kind of fishing you're trying to do too. You know, right. like like if I'm trying to like sight fish for something. I want those high, clear, sure. sunny days. And then sure. if, if we're doing something like dry fly fishing, I want it dirty, nasty, cloudy, because, you know, we want those bugs to really pop, and they mm-hmm. really like that mm-hmm. cloud cover. Very cool. Yeah, I think the last time I was there, I was with my dad, and, and I looked downstream, and this dude, like, came through the brush, and he had on, like, a hunting vest. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> bright orange. Right you'll get, you'll get like, some guys going out there duck like, hunting and, and goose <laughs> hunting and stuff. There, there's like a big wide stretch of the river they call the Sixth Tunnel and dudes will just be like jump shooting geese and, oh, and this ducks guy, and stuff. This guy was, he was fishing. Oh, okay. And he just had this big bright orange vest didn't on. Didn't want some hunter to think he's a deer, I guess. I, I, I guess so. <laughs> or he just didn't want to catch any fish. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, You've been like it, we said in the intro. You've, you're a fourth generation angler. Uh, what got who got you in the sport? Um, so my dad, you know, he uh, he kind of introduced me to fly fishing. He never really like taught me how to do it. He basically just like handed me a fly rod and was like, mm. "Have have fun, kid." That was kind of how my uh, introduction worked. But he was a teacher, so we'd get summer summer break and we'd all drive up to the Sierras and we'd fish for a couple of weeks up and down from like Bridgeport to Bishop. You know, the Owens, we fished the fished a lot on the walkers, you know, the West Walker and the East Walkers where I first fly fished. Um, and so we'd go up and down the east side as, as kids. And uh, that's how, kind of how I got into it. You didn't chase much steelhead on the coast? Uh, we did, but as little kids, we were doing it so illegally. <laughs> we were like, we were going into like the creek in our backyard with like, you know, live crayfish and like spinners and stuff like that. We'd either like whale on the little juveniles or we'd like catch like a 10 pounder and uh it was not it was all bad and, and bonk it or something probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like what kid you know typical kids yeah, do. yeah because yeah. there's some pretty crazy pictures of me and my brother when we're like you know seven eight nine ten and he's holding like a 30 inch steelhead by the by the you know the lip and like it's a bass you know it's like <laughs> oh man you look back on it and it's like so embarrassing right. but it's it's it's, it's, it's kid like stuff. blackmail yeah. material these yeah. days yeah it's it's you know kids being dumb kids. Well, I I want to I want to transition to the trucky and and talk about that. But before we get into it, I just want to set expectations for for who's listening. Um, we're not going to talk much about the actual fishing on the trucky because we've covered that quite a bit in in past episodes. Um, if you want to listen to about you know t- tips tactics on the trucky and the little trucky, um, there's episode twenty seven with Chris Mayer. There's episode 23 with John Biaki. There is episode 20 with Mike Anderson. Episode 16 with Whoa. Jordan Romney. And <laughs> finally, episode five with Matt Heron. Yeah. So that covers, um, you can, you know, if you're trying to ramp up into the trucky, just listen to those those episodes. But um, we were having a side conversation before we started the recording, and we were talking about snorkeling on the trucky. And I thought that was a pretty cool thing to talk about. I think about. everybody should snorkel their yeah. local waters, any, you know, anywhere you go, as long as it's not, rap, you know, class three rapids and 45, 40 degrees. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty rad. It's pretty eye-opening, like the, the sheer volume of fish that's under the water that you don't see. You know, you think you can, like when you're standing next to a pool or whatever, and you're like, you got your polarized glasses and you can like see all the stuff. You're like, oh yeah, there's a fish there. There's a fish there. You know, you see your mm-hmm. two or three fish. You snorkel it, and there's like 20 fish there that you just it blows your mind. Like you just don't see them. Because yeah, they're backs they, it or just whatever. they they blend in. They're tucked underneath stuff. There's all sorts of different little things that are kind of blocking your vision or just making it so you can't see. Whether it's camouflage mm-hmm. or something blocking your view. And so when you get underneath the water, that different angle it just changes everything. When you're below them, looking up, it's a whole different deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, the diversity of size classes you're seeing stuff from like an inch and a half just like little tiny bait fish darting around away from you and stuff all the way to like the biggest of the big you're seeing some tanks you know you're you know big alpha fish and everything in between you know? dude <laughs> did you, you notice where they uh they sit was there like a yeah like a standard for sure for, for those sure fish so where, like, did they the class little... up like in yeah different sections? so like your little yeah, guys they would kind of this. be like off to the sides into like the shallows almost so we're like they're barely in yeah. you know they're kind of hanging on the outskirts and then that your most of your varieties of fish are going to be in your kind of head to middle of the run kind of in the feeding lanes 
you know, doing their thing, kind of working and eating their little nymphs and stuff. And then the biggest fish would usually be kind of towards the tail out, just watching yep. what everybody else does. <laughs> yep. They're huh. just kind of Around. behind everybody else where they can't be seen from. Yep. Yeah. Or they're like tucked underneath a big rock it's or so something It's so counterintuitive like because you would think, you know, them being the, the alpha in that in that area, right, that they're going to they're going to want first dibs at the at the food coming into but that. see they're not eating the same kind of food that's the thing okay so they're well, not we'll wanting talk about to that work. a little so like the little guys are trying to eat nymphs and get every little bit of food they can and work their way up but the big guys they're eating like one meal a day and so they're not wanting to i mean they'll still eat like a nymph if it comes to them mm -hmm. but they're not like wanting to go all the way up into the feeding lanes and work for it they're trying to be the most lazy they can, the least calorie expending they can. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they go up, you know, once a day and bonk some little six incher <laughs> and then eat it and then go back to sitting on the on the couch. You know, right. that's kind of what they do. So, that, yeah, usually I'd see them, like I said, in the tail outs or like tucked underneath something like a rock mm -hmm. or behind a rock where mm -hmm. it's kind of like an ambush sort of point. It was weird. Like they had these kind of it was, it was very strategic. Where mm. like you'd see them, it, it, like if you were like trying to set up an ambush, you're like they'd be somewhere where they won't be seen until something going by. It's way too late when they just dart out and grab it. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was really kind of interesting. Hmm. It's super cool. Yeah, it was it was fun, man. You know, I do multiple passes. You know, you, you you run up and you get it's just you just get all excited doing it. You know, you like oh, run all the way to yeah. the top. You like you dive in and you kind of like. The fish don't really freak out at you too, which is kind of weird. You think that like you're swimming through there, they're just going to like scatter, scatter yeah. but they don't. They kind of just, they sort of give you a little bit of space and then they just kind of go back to doing they, their thing. They oh. probably just think you're a log or something. Well, yeah, I mean, there's totally. a lot of kayaking and rafting on that yeah, river too. Sure, so sure. That could have a little bit I, I imagine like you get out and you, you know, you're getting ready to run upstream again. It's kind of like when you're back doing water slides when you're a little kid, you know, you get that to was the totally bottom, your you, get, you get out of the pool you're and you're just like, like ready to boogie yeah. to the top again. <laughs> but uh, hey, you uh, you said that you you do uh, bass and smallmouth and largemouth up there. Sure. Um, well, we don't have too much largemouth, but we do have a lot of smallmouth. And I so, had no idea. Yeah. So that's one of the things. That, like, um, I've always tried to be real diverse as far as what I fish for and guide for. You know, it kind of it's really helpful when you have um, different water conditions. You get a drought period, or you get like real high water periods and different sort of things. It pays to be able to have knowledge of other fisheries. The more different waters you can fish, the more flexibility you have, you know, mm -hmm. with your guide trips. And you can really bounce around wherever the fishing's good. Nice little guide tip right there. Yeah. So that's always what I've kind of approached at. And, you know, I have two or three little glass rods, you know, for little creaking rods, a couple seven weights for bassin and a couple five weights for, you know, standard, you know, trout rods. I always, you know, keep a little, you know, variety with me. And, um, but the smallmouth, yeah, it's, it's killer, man. It, it, the window is kind of limited. It's not nearly as long as the trout fishing. You know, they definitely have a real long downtime where they really slow down quite a bit in the wintertime up where we're at, especially. Mm -hmm. You go down further down in like the foothills and stuff, the water temps are warmer and the fish can kind of stay active longer through the season. But where we're at, they really slow down a bunch in the winter and they get pretty tough. Um, but from like April, May, June, you know, kind of depending on the season, depending on the year, all the way through until late September, October, it's game on. You know, any of the warmer months of the year, it's pretty darn fun. I was what telling Chad that the this warm, warm, warm little wave that we're gonna get come through, it's gonna it's gonna pop that bass bite. Mm -hmm. I bet. I got a know. buddy with a local pond here, and he's got like ten pounders. <laughs> we're gonna, I'm gonna just. I love I love bass it man. Next week. It's so fun, like because like I was saying in La Honda, we had a couple little bass ponds, and that's kind of what started it for me. Is is we had these little ponds that had like eh, not ten but five six pound bass, and you you know go after them. I started off like making my own little plugs, like I would carve little balsa poppers and stuff wow. when I was you know like ten twelve, and then that's kind of what got me into fly tying, and then fly uh. tying was what got me really serious about fly fishing. I was just like, oh dude, you can imitate anything. This is so cool. Oh, that's you know? that's it's totally counterintuitive because yeah. I would have thought you would have got in the like. When, when I do. started to tie, I was like into the fly fishing thing. And then I started tying out of necessity because yeah. I couldn't find stuff. But you went through from the other direction. Yeah. Like I, I had fly fished, but I wasn't like about it. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah this is pretty cool. But usually like when we go up to the Sierras, I'd have the fly rod. I'd have the spinning rod. I'd fish for about five minutes with the fly rod, get pissed and then go and throw my little, you know, Panther Martin and, and just rope. slay <laughs> and just like, all right. And that, that's, you know, it's when you're like 12 or 10 or whatever. That's like kind of how your mind works. It's all about, yeah, right. exactly. 
And then when I got a little bit older, I was like, you know, I kind of wanted to know more about the details. I yeah. kind of want to learn how to imitate stuff and all those sort of things. And that, that's kind of what, uh, you know, um, pushed me in that direction with the fly tying and all that. Where that's, that's super cool. Let's, so let's talk about that with the trucky, um, top three bugs that you like. Um, you like fishing from good truck. question. Um, you know, it's hard to beat the dirt snake on the Truckee. Um, <laughs> the dirt snake. The, the San Juan worm. Yeah. <laughs> and about, I talked to a guy recently. He won't even, he'll never fish it. Yeah. Ever. I, I he like just won't tie it on. That's fine. That's understandable, <laughs> you know. And then... Um, In what color? Like bright or brown or... I tie a bunch of different ones, you know. You know, I've, I've had some like an inch or two up to like mega ones, like Do you, big what, worms. What, uh, are you using like the wormy material? Are you using the... Uh, I don't use stuff, the... Chenille? I've used the squirmy Chenille? stuff. Ultra I use the squirmy, Chenille. wormy, the, the rubber stuff and it... Mm -hmm. Like it like melts in my fly yeah, box half the time and then it I falls like apart. I hate that. Yeah. I don't like it. So I usually use the chenille. I've just always used it and it works fine. Like last year during the really uh, super high yep. water, the, what happened was the river got so high it flooded way up on the banks. And then once it receded, the banks were really saturated with water. And then they sloughed off. It was just worm, and just worm central. Earthworms everywhere. So you'd find them all in like the shallows and stuff. So I started tying these like four or five inch long San Juans and just crushing. <laughs> like we hooked multiple 30 inch fish last spring. On, it was like, on, on like natural colors or? Yeah, just earthworm color, yeah. like dirty pink kind of a color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like uh, that kind of thing is, is pretty deadly, you know, and, yeah. and definitely some of the biggest fish I've had hooked on the truck here. More often actually clients have had, have been on like a big San Juan worm, you huh. know. Um, other flies, you know, the, um, the turd fly, the old, uh, Pat's rubber legs and Brown, you yeah. know, that works really, really well. Um, those are kind of my main two lead flies. It's just real simple to tie on one of those two. They're real quick and easy to tie. They work big fish, eat them, you know? So yeah, I fish a, a rubber leg of some sort typically as my point fly. Cause yeah. I do a lot of, I do a lot of ESN styles. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You just tie one with a bunch of lead on it and it yeah, works man. good as an anchor yeah. fly. Yeah. Um, and then kind of depending on the, uh, time of year, if it's warmer summer months, I'm going to put on a little soft tackle, kind of a caddis pupa. If it's the colder months, I'm going to put on some sort of betas. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. generally, it's going to be something kind of along those lines. Like what size roughly for the winter? For the winter, uh, you know, that you don't have to do the micro stuff on the main truckie, you know, usually like an 18, but mm -hmm. it depends on what's hatching. You know, okay. there's a ton of little bugs. I'll put on a smaller fly. Okay. You know? But usually like an 18 is pretty good. I've heard of some guys really targeting those bigger fish like that, you know, crawd at, crawd, crawfish mm -hmm. pattern and then a little something micro right behind it. Yeah. And that's, that's you know, the, the crayfish would be the other interchangeable fly of that lead fly. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some sort of bait fish imitation, like a little, you know, uh, like you could tie like balance leeches and just different sort of like bait fish jig flies and run one of those as your lead fly on a, on a multi-nymph rig. What, that what's, works a, really good. what's a balanced leech? I've read about it, but I can't remember. It's basically a jig fly, you know, okay. that's tied on. A, uh, it's made to, so when it hangs directly underneath the, uh, the line, it stays horizontal. You know, it doesn't, you know, get pulled. You know, it, you can kind of hang it underneath the bobber and it just kind of keeps bounces up and down. So yeah. it like un undulates in the column. Yeah. Okay. It was, they kind of first sort of started tying them up mm. for lake fishing, but you can fish them in rivers and stuff too. All it's right. just a, a, a small jig. Basically. Okay, but uh, a woolly bugger or, or a marabou leech, but tied on like a jig style hook kind of thing. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I'd always yeah. ever thought about doing that on the coast, but never on yeah. a, a trout stream. Yeah. If you guys uh, down here, you have these foothill uh, you know, lakes with all the bass and stuff. You know, if you have lots of shad and that sort of thing, they mm -hmm. work really well down here on mm -hmm. the on the bass stuff. Mm -hmm. I have a buddy that's gotten some ten pound plus uh, largemouth over in Clear Lake and some of those lakes on them too. Oh, nice. Yeah. We were, um, I had mentioned ESN earlier. That's a uh, European style nymphing. Thanks, Mike Anderson, for telling, explaining that one to me. But basically, we're talking about high sticking, tight line nymphing, ESN, all that stuff. Um, and then you were, you were saying that, you know, it, it got started in Dunsmere, and we've covered that a little bit before. But can you kind of like talk about the, you know, where it started and then kind of like how it got it Actually, the appropriate? Polish, right? Is that what you said? The, yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah, they call it check nymphing, but a lot of people's credited actually the first guy to really doing it in the competitions and stuff was this guy, uh, um, Vladi Trisbunia. 
And uh, I actually met Vladi. He's a really, really super nice guy. And you'll hear people talk about like the Vladi worm. Yeah. It's like the sort of like pink sort of condom fly. But Vladi and a couple of the Polish guys, a lot of them were actually were the dudes doing doing the, the sort of short line styles. And then, but the Czechs, you know, generally were the guys that popularized it. And so a lot of the other European, you know, competitors saying, oh, that's Czech nymphing. Well, a lot of the time, actually, the Poles were doing it before them. And, and the Poles learned probably from looking at old books from old uh, stuff from guys in the U.S. And uh, like, because people were doing that sort of style, you know, 100 years ago, plus, you know, 120 years ago, basically early 1900s. And um, the Ted Tolan Dolly, mm-hmm. all the dudes that taught like uh, Ted Fay and We're Joe talking Kimsey Dunsmere, and all those guys. Yeah, the, McLeod area. All those uh, Wintu guys. So the Wintu tribe up uh, by Shasta, they would do all this stuff on like the upper sack and McLeod and all these sort of things. Um, weighted flies, tied multiple. They weren't necessarily doing droppers. They were, I think they tied mostly in line. Mm-hmm. And then they would just follow their leader and they would lead it through slots mm-hmm. just like how they do the sort of Euro Czech style. Yeah. And it's just been modified, but it's basically the same idea. You do that with the crayfish patterns? Um, I don't do that short lining as much. I do it every now and then, um, just kind of goofing around. A lot of times I'll do kind of a hybrid with, with indicators and mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, I like the versatility it kind of does because I can fish close with that. And then I can fish 40 feet out and do slack lining, like mending and drifting. So mm-hmm. you're saying when you when you say you're fishing a hybrid, you're just you're you're using check style flies, probably, but no weight in the system. Is that right? No, I'm doing like um, just a regular indica- indicator setup. Okay, but just do like short lining and high sticking okay. with it. Got yeah. it. And up close, yeah. you know, it, it's there's certain water types it doesn't really do as well when you have a real fast current on the surface. That's where the indicator really goes downhill fast Mm -hmm. as far as its effectiveness. And then if you have like a more uniform current where it's kind of slower on the top and still kind of slowish on the bottom, that's where the indicator starts to shine. Makes sense. And so the bigger the contrast and speed between the surface and the bottom, Mm -hmm. the less the indicator is going to work for. And the reason is the indicator gets ahead of everything and pulls everything up. Yeah, it starts pulling everything through there. Well, let's talk about the um, the conservation stuff that you're, sure. you're either doing or, or a part of. Um, you sit on the the board of the of TU. What what is what does Trout Unlimited do exactly up there? Um, so Trout Unlimited is a nonprofit organization. Its primary goal is to restore and and um, conserve you know cold water fisheries. You know, so uh, trout, salmonids in general, salmon, whitefish, grayling, all those guys. Um, and so what we do in the Truckee area, we're a chapter of them. And so we organize conservation programs, river restoration, river cleanups, um, you know, tracking fish, all sorts of different sorts of programs to, uh, to try to improve and, and conserve, uh, and restore the, the, the cold water fisheries up in the Truckee area. And we actually cover quite a bit bigger than just the Truckee area, but yeah. that's kind of our base camp. And you guys did work on, um, the little trucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we did, uh, about six years ago, we started a project and it, it took about five years to accomplish and we yeah. finished not last fall, but the fall before. Yeah. And, um, it was a really cool project. I mean, it, um, it took a stretch of water that had a few fish and now it actually holds quite a bit of fish. And, and once, once a project, the restoration project like that is done, the, the, the effect is actually pretty immediate and profound from what I've been told. You know, yeah, you, you would it's think crazy. It literally like is it like happens almost overnight. Next in day, some cases, yeah, you had places where there weren't fish before, yeah. and all of a sudden there are fish holding it's there. Crazy, and it's literally like the first day after they had like pulled the stuff out, or they put the stuff in. I was gonna say it was. So, what do you see as far as the most productive is just adding structure to? Um, there's lots of different things that can work. You know, it really depends on the situation with the water type. So, like the little trucky, what you had is this about halfway th- down through the meadow is there's a fault line and the gradient of the river increases from that point. So it goes a lot steeper. Mm-hmm. And so the river had a tendency to channelize and just be uh, a, a shoot. You know, it didn't really have places for stuff to collect and slow down. And um, when you have a dam upstream that intercepts new debris, trees, right. boulders, things from like that, from being able to get washed down and, and depositing themselves. 
And so what we did is we added boulders, added trees down that lower stretch where the, the gradient was a little higher to create current breaks for fish to hold. And once you start getting those higher water flows, it kind of digs all that out mm-hmm. and makes everything mm-hmm. deeper and slower and deeper and slower. And that's what we really kind of needed. It was, it was, it was fast and shallow. And now it's a lot deeper and slower. And there's a lot structure, more. yeah, just yeah. like you should see so, a natural runoff. And when you get migratory fish, it's giving them places to kind of hold and rest as they're working their way up and on their way back down to the reservoir. And then you just have like permanent habitat for them too. Yes. And then we did a lot of other stuff too with little side channels for juvenile rearing, you know, giving them little places to kind of hide out when they're like that, you know, two, three, four inch yeah. sort of size. And is cow trout, uh, do, they, do they have a similar charter? Mm-hmm. Or are they pretty much this they they do yeah. restoration and sure yeah. caltrout actually was a um it started by people that were in trout unlimited okay and what they wanted to do is they kind of wanted to separate themselves from tu national and kind of do their own thing and but they have pretty much the exact same goals okay. you know they're trying to to restore and, and cool. improve river quality uh well you know, for the for the, uh, the the folks that are listening, if they wanted to get involved with with uh, your organization, what what's the best way to do that? You know, hit us up on Facebook. You know, we have a a real active uh, page there. We every time we do like programs and things like that, we uh, we do little updates and stuff. If you just look up, uh, I think it's probably Truckee Trout Unlimited One Hundred Three. It'll yeah. be something like that. Okay. Or, or Trout Unlimited One Hundred Three Truckee Chapter or something. Um, but if they look up our Facebook page, they can contact us through there. Real easy. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, your speaking, I know you're a guest speaker, and you cover ethics and also um, tactics. Tactics, I understand. Sure. Ethics, um, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a gray area because that would sound weird. But no, no, uh, what specifically is. are you talking about yeah. when it comes to ethics? Everybody's and fly perception fishing? of ethics is going to be a little different. Yeah. Don't pork and some guy in his hole. Yeah. Don't hide <laughs> hole anybody. Uh, the main thing I've always tried to like, you know, the approach I've tried to take with ethics is treating people how you want to be treated. That golden rule, you know? Yeah. yeah. Always treat other people the way you want to be treated. And um, generally, the more remote a water is, the more space I give an angler. You know, um, if I'm at Pyramid Lake, there's guys everywhere. Yeah. And so you're you're going to be fishing a little bit closer to people. If I'm backpacking into some stream, I'm going to give that dude a couple hundred yards or a quarter mile or whatever. I'm going to give him a lot of space. And um, and if all else fails, just communicate. New Zealand kind of has a cool method. Speaking of communication, like you walk up to a beat, you know, or the trailhead. Sure. And a car that's all dusty will have, they'll actually write on the window, right? Hey, we went up you know, five miles up this Creek or, you know, we went upstream or we went downstream just sure. sort of telling people, you know, where That's they went. Cool. That That's cool. That's cool. I thought that was kind of neat. I didn't come across that when I was down there. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool that somebody would do that. It's kind yeah. of a, just a known golden rule. Like you were saying, you yeah. know, just there's so much water there yeah. and, and there's, you want to be able to walk a, a it's rad. section. Not it's see really somebody. cool. And, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for the, the iPhone case that, I can just throw the drone up. The case is a drone, and I can throw it up and just make it go downstream really quick and send me a video Scout. feed. And, oh yeah, it's like, gonna oh, happen. Oh damn, there's a guy down there, like it's half mile happen. down. Damn it, okay, DJI's let's go got up. something called a spark that'll fit in your hand, but it's just you know I don't want to spend five hundred dollars on a little thing that, that that's just to tell me if somebody's up or downstream. <laughs> but yeah, generally the ethics is treat how other people how you want to be treated. The more remote it is, the more space you give. And above all else, just communicate. Yeah, so it sounds like it's it's just basically a, a code of conduct when you're on the water. Sure, here's, and there's other stuff to too that goes along with that. Yeah. You know, fish handling and all those sorts yeah. of things. If you're doing catch and release, how to handle a fish, and, mm-hmm. and uh, depending on what species you know you're catching, how to handle a catch and release. You know, if you're catching bass, it's different than if you're handling trout. You ever been on the water with clients and then see somebody else come come around you and try to get it in the hole, or you see some you know, oh, yeah. mishandling fish? Do you ever? Oh, yeah. do you, no, what, that totally you happened to us over? on Saturday. You really? know? Yeah. So we're like in this hole. We got up there early and, and uh, we get into this hole and we're fishing and this, it just starts getting popping and really good. And some guy like comes up and just starts fishing right across from us. <laughs> and I had one guy on one side of the river and one guy downstream a little ways on the other side of the river. And so I went across and down to my other guy and I had another rod next to him. I grabbed the other rod, grabbed him. And as we're leaving, I'm like, dude, 
I don't mind if you fish across from us or whatever, but just ask or say something. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and and he got pissed. And I'm just like, dude, I'm just trying to be nice. You know, you, the hole's all yours. We're out of here. You know, we'd already stuck a bunch of fish anyway. Yeah. So, but I mean, like, yeah, that's the thing, like, is people a lot of times don't really get the taught ethics or any of that sort of stuff, you yeah. know, and, and how to like, you know, you know, be kind and, and, and respectful. Or they know 90% anglers. of the time the guide or whoever it is is going to pick up and leave because they're so pissed that yeah. somebody came down in, you know, because like, that's typically like, what I that's, do. That's, that's the, the other thing that like know, people man. see a guide, they automatically that he knows where oh, the fish are. Oh, this has got to be right. the right spot. Oh, this yeah. is the spot. Yeah. And so they automatically start fishing next to you. It's yeah. annoying as hell. <laughs> I, I've, um, this just happened actually in Truckee on the, on the LT, like into the inlet, into the, the lower, lower lake. And, um, I was fishing, it hooked up a fish. And there was a guy up on the, on the road still. He's like watching us. Sure. I hooked this fish up and then kind of have to chase it downstream. What, I don't know, maybe 20 yards. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I leave my spot. Yeah, you just go down around the corner a little the, bit to go deal fish, with it. Yeah, get the fish, release the fish, go back to the spot, and the dude's in there. And I'm like, "Bro, I was just there. You know, I was there." <laughs> too. I and he's like, "Oh, are you still fishing here?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not yeah, anymore." <laughs> no, people people try to do that stuff. They they think they're being slick and and all sorts of stuff, and it, it's really just it's kind of sleazy, you know, and. Yeah. Most they they feign ignorance. That's the classic right. thing is to feign yeah. ignorance. Oh, I didn't know. Were you still fishing this? You know, you get it with uh, guys like we get a lot of poachers in our area too, and they'll like bait fish. And there's like signs everywhere that they're walking down to the water. You know, they, they're walking past like four signs saying no bait fishing, no bait fishing, catch and release, you know, wild trout water, whatever. And they walk past all of it and just start bait fishing right in this one hole. And you like walk up to them. It's always like on like 4th of July or whatever. It's one of these holiday weekends, oh, yeah. you know. And you're like, hey, dude, you know, you can't bait fish here. You're going to get a pretty hefty fine if you get caught doing that. They're like, oh, I didn't know. You're like, dude, you knew. <laughs> you, know, you just walked past like eight signs, you know. But um, the classic, yeah, the classic defense mechanism to just feign ignorance is, is pretty common in the, in the fishermen. So let's, I, I know you, you tie flies because um, Chris was talking about your, your legendary crayfish pattern. Um, and you, you tie for Umqua. So how did, I want to know, like, there's there's probably some guides out there that, are, that tie and feel like they could probably, you know, sell on an Umqua. How do you even become an Umqua tire? Sure. What's that um, process? You know, um, first off, you got to kind of get in touch with the, the, the reps or whoever, you know, with your, so in the Western area, the main rep for, for our region is uh, Darren Elmore. And so he's the Umqua Feather Merchants rep. You get in touch with Darren, you know, you can get in touch with him through your local fly shop or whatever, whoever carries Umqua in your mm -hmm. area. Just go up to him, them, and say, hey, I want to get in touch with Darren Elmore. They'll get you his number and you and you go, Hey, I got this killer, you know, steelhead smolt or whatever. I don't care what, what the fly is. You just got something that works real good. You're like, oh, I catch tons of fish on this, you know, uh, this new bass popper, you know, and uh, it just crushes. And you'll send them into them. And then it, it especially pays off if you got some sort of like um, buzz about the fly, you know. If, right. If, if you're you like all over social media or, or some sort of magazine yeah. article or, or you're some sort of blog postings or whatever, if you got some sort of you know, trail of information about that fly and people being fired up about it, catching big fish, that sort of thing. Um, you'll send it into him and, and he'll go and look at it and he'll kind of go, yeah, that's a pretty cool fly, you know, and he'll kind of, he'll offer you some advice maybe on some little minor things, you know, mm -hmm. if it's like a, maybe it's a bass popper and he'll be like, Hey, maybe you should put a weed guard on that, you know, and it'd probably be like perfect. You know, he'll, you know, he's looked at thousands and thousands of flies and knows what sells and what doesn't mm -hmm. sell. He'll kind of go, okay, yeah, you can maybe do this or that. And you know, that would probably be set. And, and then at that point they send them off. You, you have to uh, tie up samples of the fly. And if it's a certain flies, a lot of them, you'll have to do multiple colors. You know, let's say you're doing like a streamer, you might do like a shad color. You might do like a fire tiger color. You might do, you know, some sort of, you know, perch or whatever. You have all these different sort of color patterns that you might do with a particular fly. You tie like six of all those different color patterns of the fly. You send them into Umqua. Then usually you have to do like a step-by-step. -step. Either you can tie the fly and stop it after each step. So tie in the wing, tie it off, knot it. 
tie in the wing and then the body tied off knot it tie in the wing body head tied off knot and, and and so on through the whole course of the fly all the different steps just each fly and then stopped at the end of each step you know if it's a 10 step fly you got 10 mm-hmm. separate partial flies until you get to your final fly you send those sample flies off to them they send them off to a factory in philippines or, or sri lanka or wherever mm-hmm. and then they send back flies and then you look at them and you go okay yeah the body is way too fat <laughs> And they send them back. They send another sample back. Okay, now the eyes are glued funny. They're glued too high or whatever. And so you kind of have this back and forth, Mm -hmm. you know, two, three, however many times of that fly going out to a factory, them sending it back. And and you kind of like, eventually you get to a point where you're like, okay, that's good enough. So that's close enough. They never get it 100% perfect. Because there's so many little finite details that just right, are yeah. so difficult to translate to the other side of the world. But you get it to where, like, yeah, that'll catch a lot of fish. Surprised you don't just, you know, videotape it or something and send that off. That's what I did, actually. And yeah. so I did, like, photographs. And then I did, like, files. And then right. sent them, like, you know, a photograph With stop. A little note step. saying, make sure, you, you know, you keep Yeah, and I did, like, written bit, instructions right. for the whole thing. And all that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah, sure. So, ba- so you're you're basically constructing a recipe, and then you mm-hmm. license your pattern to them. Yeah. Is that how that model works? Pretty much. Okay. And they and actually, what's kind of trippy is they um, they copyright your name instead of just your pattern. And so, if I have so instead of like Whitlock's this and that, you know, Montana Fly or whoever else can't do Whitlock's this and that. You know, they they can't right. copy the pattern. They can copy the actual pattern, but they can't have Not your name, name describing it. Yeah. yeah. And so like mine's like a little generic damsel. knockoff. So, yeah. yeah, it's really hard to, to police any of that stuff. So, yeah, right. so a lot of guys that have uh, a lot of patterns, you know, um, you know, Ralph Cutter and, and Mercer. Andy Burke and Mercer and, and Whitlock and all these guys, you know, John Barr, you know, all these dudes have all these different patterns. Everybody knocks them off. You know, and, and it can be challenging, it can be frustrating, but I mean, yeah. it's just kind of the um, the way the industry works. For so the then it's part. a rev share deal. Like you just you just get you get money from them in perpetuity mm-hmm. based on how many flies yeah. it's they're just selling. get a royalty check, which is awesome. Okay, it's actually a pretty cool deal. Once you yeah. kind of get your once fly in the catalog, yeah, I was gonna say once you're in the system, I just get a check that comes and shows up, and I'm like, it's oh, dope. cool. You know, grocery money, beer money, whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get rich doing it. You know, I get paid dozens of dollars. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> but but it's, it, it is like nice to just get this random check that just shows up. Yeah. You know? yeah. And okay. um, I always wondered how that worked. That's that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's a cool deal, you know, and and but dudes like, you know, like a John Barr or a Mercer, they get some pretty hefty checks, you know, because yeah. they have like, you know, 50 patterns that are all mm-hmm. kind of adding up. You know, if you got like two or three patterns, yeah, it's not a lot of money. But if yes. you have fifty, it, it adds up. And Especially like a like Copper John. Fox, yeah. I was gonna say Fox's pupa. Or yeah, Copper Fox John. in this sort of region, Fox's yeah. caddis pupa. Right. Yeah, and it sounds like if you've got a pattern and you've actually got some marketing steam behind that pattern already, that you can ride that wave into that agreement because I'm sure all those agreements with them are negotiable. You know. Um, well, I mean, as far as like the, like the royalty percentages, is that yeah, what you're talking about? Yeah. No, those are basically they're set in stone for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's 8%, uh, whatever their sales okay. is, huh. sales are, um, I think it used to be 10, but I think it's eight currently. That's basically across the board. So okay. if they sell, you know, a thousand dollars a year flies, you get 8% of that, which is pretty, yeah. pretty cool. So, um, Chris Mayer, who we, we had on recently, he talked about your, your crayfish pattern. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't seen this thing yet. What what's what's so killer about it, and what colors do you make, and all that? Um, so uh, I have a couple different ones, but um, the one I really like, I, I tie on like a jig hook, and um, I tie it with just some little bead chain, a little bit of lead, and um, like any jig, it rides inverted, so I can fish it real heavy and deep, and it doesn't hang up as much. Um, and then also with like most crayfish patterns, they're kind of dressed kind of small and skinny. And the actual crayfish, they're kind of real bulky mm-hmm. in the carapace and the thorax and all that sort of area. The mass is really at the body. And then as the bigger the crayfish gets, the bigger their claws get, you know. Mm-hmm. But like a smaller crayfish, 
that sort of two to three inch sort of variety. That's like the preferred ones, it seems like, for fish. Because that's just, um, I don't know, it's an easier mouthful, I guess. Yeah. You know, those sense. I've tied like five, six inch crayfish, and they suck. You know, you'll you'll fish the hell out of them and you just don't get many grabs. But you fish those little two incher ones, mm-hmm. and they just get crush. Pounded. And, and uh, you know, I've heard a lot from like spin guys that that um, use crayfish a lot for like smallmouth and all those sorts of species. They really like those smaller bite sized crayfish. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if it's just because it's easier to di- digest, don't have to worry about the claws as much or whatever. The smaller the crayfish, especially like that sort of bite size. Is definitely usually the way to go. I think they're just they're softer, you know. Yeah, and fish like to eat them a little bit better. And, and, and like when they ones. do their little molting thing, you right. know, that is like game on when they're doing that a lot. So that's what, what, so that's basically they're they're losing their shell and getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's just like a crab, you know, or any yeah. of those sort of crustaceans. They'll right. they'll shed their shell so they can grow a little bigger. Yeah. And they they periodically they do this multiple times a year. Well, do you know, but in it's, the it's middle seasonal? of summer is the biggest. Okay, so like July. Yeah, well, it's it's more like late July on into August. Okay. Um, that's where they kind of do a real big one where you'll you'll walk along and you can tell when it's happening because there's all these empty crayfish you'll shells. See shucks on them. Yeah, there's shucks yeah. all over the shallows, and you're like, oh, okay. All right, time to tie put on. one of those baskets. Yeah, on. yeah, whip up that little guy and tie it on, and and yeah, it's game on. Okay. But um, the the one pattern I think he was talking about actually have um on our little tu we have a little newsletter. Uh, if you go to tahotroutbum.org slash newsletters, um, we have these little newsletters that we've done. It's basically like an online magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, every one, I'll do a fly tying recipe. Oh, cool. And I think spring. You published it? Uh, it's online. You know? Okay. And so spring 2016, I think, if you go to tahotroutbum.org slash newsletters, there's like eight I'm or six to check that out yeah each one we put a little you know fly tying recipe for cool you know some are like big articulated streamers some are a little you know bluing olive soft ackles some are you know we kind of do a different recipe and it's usually seasonally you know based you know so if, yeah. it's, if we're going into the summer I might do a crayfish article if we're going into winter I might do a betas or I might do a you know uh, uh, some sort of you know you know whatever you know it just depends on what yeah. time of the year it is um, so if you're going to the fall, maybe an October cat is people or whatever. And so we do these different patterns based mm. on time of year. And and will you fish a dropper off the bottom <laughs> of those ever? Um, yeah, usually I fish, you know, a, a dropper off the crayfish, but I fished them by themselves a lot too. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> that little jig crayfish is pretty fun because you can fish it isolated, you know, with just, just the fly. You can fish it on a tandem nymph rig with the bobber. You can high stick it. You can put it on a, like a, a short line check nymph rig. It's just a weighted crayfish. Mm-hmm. It's kind of almost like a an improved woolly bugger on a jig hook. Okay. It's kind of you could do it a lot of different ways depending on how you want to fish it. I've thrown it on a on a switch rod and a spare rod and uh, two handed rods and it works great like that swinging mm-hmm. and uh, high stick and dead drift it sight fished with it. Um, fish for smallmouth with it. I was just going to say, yeah. Yeah. I've got a lot of different species. Uh, the first time I was kind of playing around with, uh, a, a, not that pattern, but one really, really, really similar. Uh, I got like four or five fish, four or five species in the first 24 hours, which is crazy. I got like <laughs> common <laughs> carp, smallmouth, largemouth, uh, rainbows and browns the first day fishing with it. I just played around in a couple of different waters yeah. in the area and everything would eat it, you know, which is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I, um, you know, we've always talked about fishing crayfish in the context of the Truckee Tahoe area, but I, I see crayfish like pretty much every stream I've been on around lakes, here. too. And you it crushes largemouth and yeah, smallmouth. Like and bass think, <clears throat> love crayfish. I'm going to fish it more this year. You know, I just yeah. haven't, I, I don't fish it enough, and I'm, and I'm going to. There's a lot year. of, there's a million different techniques to fish it, too, yeah. just yeah. like he was saying. It's kind of like a woolly bugger. There's not really a wrong way to fish it. Right. It's just what's the right way to fish it now, you yeah. know? And so there's different situations where it's like, yeah, I could totally f- use it right here doing this. And you try it out, and you're like, oh, shit, that worked. Yeah. You know? It's pretty cool. And you, and likely to get a bigger fish also just yeah. because it's a bigger prey. I think everything loves it. The, the guides on the on the sack salmon fishing, I mean, if you want to catch fish or double your chances of catching fish, you put little crawdad meat yeah. on there. So yeah. when I was a little kid, <laughs> um, we had this little steelhead stream in our backyard. And what me and my brother would always used to do is we would catch live crayfish, hook them up, 
and then we would find like the biggest log or or log jam, mm-hmm. something with a big pocket to hide underneath it. Mm-hmm. And that's where the steelhead would sit. Mm-hmm. It's because it was such a small stream. They couldn't really sit in like a run or anything. It wasn't really a, a defined they run. They hide a little bit, yeah. There were just pockets and little things where they could kind of hide and get away because otherwise, you know, a, you know, a raccoon or some other, you know, mountain lion, bobcat, things like that would actually get them. So they'd, they'd get these places where they couldn't really be seen. And so we'd get a live crayfish, put it on a hook, and then toss it under these little, you know, you know, pockets and things, you know, underneath stuff. And we'd get big fish like that, you know, it was huh. pretty cool. And that kind of was like, maybe that's part of the uh, impetus for me to, you know, fish crayfish and stuff it, like that. It now. probably is, man. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. it works. And and there's there's, your there's a book out there floor. where this guy was cruising down a steelhead river and he walked along, came across some chick that was naked fishing crawdad tails. Mm. You, you know, know what I'm talking of, about? Yeah, talking that's about the river Y, isn't it? The river Y, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yeah. there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Good read, Chad. You'd like it. Crayfish and naked women. Naked chicks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nick Hannah, cool. buddy. Hey, Nick Hannah. River Y. It's a good book, actually. Good. Yeah, it's uh, David James Duncan. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think that's a good way to transition to rod building. So, <laughs> um, you you do build rods, and yeah. Nick built built rods when he was at Chico Fly Shop, so why don't you guys just geek out on rods for a minute? <laughs> sure, I sure. I know nothing about them other than they're expensive. You know, they don't have to be, you know, it's just like anything else. You know, you, I've built fly rods for like 50 bucks right? and you know, they worked great. You know, they would catch fish, you know, eventually you break them or whatever and you wouldn't really be able to fix them. But you know, like if you had like a sage blank or something, you could mail that part off and get a new one back. But, um, you can get blanks like on eBay for like 20 bucks. Have you ever gotten oh, a splicing? Uh, you ever tried that? Splicing you know, I haven't tried together. it, you know, but I, I it know takes guys an do inventory it. of blanks you gotta have a lot of pieces to, to do it yeah but um, is it just because you have to match it up yeah you yeah. gotta try to find a to basically you're creating your own feral right you're without it knocking yeah so it's mm. and you got to try to like match the flexing of the rod too because mm-hmm. you don't want it to like flex mm-hmm. not flex and then all of a sudden start flexing again yeah you, know? you could typically do it if you from anywhere the you know from the butt to the middle of the rod you know once you start getting the tip then it's you're losing that action of the yeah because there's so much more flexing going on there down the lower part of the rod, not as big of a deal because it's it's all fairly stiff. Hopefully. So tell us a little bit about your rod, your rod building. How'd you get into it? Um, so it kind of started a long time ago. Um, like in the late '90s, I was working at a little fly shop in Palo Alto in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. and um, back then, Jamie Lyle, the sage rep, he brought in this like special super key employee pro form, and. It was just like a sheet that had all the different sage rods. Sage blanks. And yeah. Like, and and well, I was I like, oh, that. sage blank. Yeah. It was totally what it was like. I was like, a hundred bucks. Hell yeah. So I bought like two or three of these blanks. I remember this. I remember yeah. this sheet. I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. And you get this sheet and you're like, oh man, that's awesome. I get a bunch of these blanks and I'll just build sage rods for myself. And then uh, I just like sat on them though. Because I had like, I didn't really have like a workshop. And you know, I was like, you know, total trout bum, you know, the trout bum, which is kind of the equivalent of the ski bum, you know, I basically had like a little hole in the wall apartment, you know, as a kid. And so I didn't have like a place to build it. And, uh, so I had these blanks. And so for a while I like wanted to build, but I didn't have the the capacity. And so what I would do is I'd go out and get books on rod building and then I would just geek out on those. And so I just spent a long time just like reading, you know, Dale Clemens, all these different rod builders, uh, Garcia, all these guys, and just check out their stuff and kind of learn like the wrapping tricks and different, you know, styles of wrapping, you know, how to do wrapping stuff with the tricks, epoxy. meaning like putting the bo- the thread uh, across from you, putting a dictionary down and re- put, pulling Well, that's the thread, like the basic, but like through it and then doing different the sort of things with like, like weaving the thread together to catch the thread. Right, right. And so you can mm-hmm. do like patterns right, or right. if you wanted to do like, um, you know, different kinds of decorative wraps and things like that. Like I, I started like learning how to do all that sort of stuff just by reading about it. And then um, maybe about six years ago, uh, I was in an apartment and we had an extra room that wasn't being used. And so that got like converted to the rod building room mm-hmm. and storage of equipment room. And so I started building in there and it was really, really fun to kind of play around with and mess with. And so ever since then, I've been kind of doing it on the side. And uh, 
Yeah, it's fun, man. So you got yourself a rod wrapping machine with a little foot pedal? Yeah, exactly. I have nice. uh, like a foot pedal, and then uh, um, you can switch it to being on slow mode for mm-hmm. doing the epoxy curing and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let, let's talk about like you know if I I'm not going to build rods, but let's just say that I that I would get into that. What what's the base? What's a starter kit look like? You can make a starter setup for just a few bucks, like a cardboard box and some spools of thread right. and like a heavy book and huh. you can start wrapping rods yeah. when you have the materials for the rod itself, right, like right. the guides and the thread and stuff. Right. You literally can knock it out with that. Um, if you really want to get it to where it's a little nicer, it's nice to have a, a, a dryer. So a slow turning motor that can cure your epoxy in the rod, so like but you can spit. do it by hand. You it's can, like a chicken on a spit kind of a thing. It's totally a rotisserie dryer motor. Okay. Okay. And the, that's what some of them are. And then other ones are different kinds of motors, but same idea where it just turns really, really, really slowly. So the epoxy cures nice and even. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. So, but you can get a real nice setup for like maybe 300 bucks and uh with like the motors and the all the little yeah you know um you know rolling little sort of station and things like that those are like really really nice and you can totally knock it out and then there's guys that have like the super pro you know fifteen hundred dollar ones you know but you can actually get a pretty nice one for 300 bucks yeah um, it's it's actually a lot more affordable than i thought it was to get yeah. get started on that unless you want to get in some production then you need a lathe right. and all kinds right. of stuff yeah. you ever turned a yeah. core candle on a lathe yeah absolutely so yeah. um my buddy Jay Scary. Cockrum, um, <laughs> you guys should interview actually Jay Cockrum. He'd make a great interview. Uh, he makes the Jadicators. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, I met him on we, the we met, met him on the, sack, the yeah. lower sack at the boat dock one time. So he's a um, he's a guide out of the Truckee area, but he also guides up here like half the year, and uh, actually probably more like three quarters of the year up here now. But um, worked with Jay a long time, and and um, a lot of times during the winter time, it's nice and slow. I'll hit him up and I'm like, hey, Jay, what are you doing? You know, and I'll cruise over to his house. We'll hang out, have some coffee or whatever. And he'll be knocking out his little jadicators. And if he gets some time free, I'll be able to break out my rods and put them on the lathe and, mm-hmm. and, and shape some handles on some cork. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'll kind of show him like, oh, hey, I like for little creek rods. I like this yeah. kind of shape or whatever. Full wells. Yeah, like full wells or all the different cigars. Western. And, yeah. yeah. Do you guys sit at the lathe like um, Patrick? Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore on on Ghost, <laughs> <laughs> just like spooning on yeah, the lid. Exactly. You know, I, I've tried to push that angle. He's, He's just not, not into, into it. it. You know, uh, it's, it's dangerous, man. You need goggles. I mean, you got a yeah. rod, a graphite rod in this thing that's spinning super fast. Yeah, right, to turn the cork. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you've, you, you got to be careful because you're if, taking if, off just like little bits at a time, right? Well, you can't yeah. really you dig can start into with it. a chisel and then you go to like you know fifty, yeah. then a hundred, okay. then two fifty sandpaper, and eventually you're using like this like eight hundred or so you actually grit. get it when you get it down to where you, you final the final kind of fit and finish you're actually using sandpaper then. yep oh yeah like real oh, fine stuff okay if know. you want it to be like real That's smooth cool. and, and soft feeling yeah. you use pretty fine stuff okay you know and if you want you can depending on the quality or your cork you can use filler to kind mm-hmm. of fill in the, the chunks mm-hmm. or if it's a really good cork you don't need filler okay you know? and that's really nice but it's harder and harder to get good cork. Like more and more of the best cork is getting sent off to winemakers. Yep. You know, uh, for, for that's good. why you're seeing like golf, you know, golf grips on fly rods these yeah, days. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, like the Reddington. Uh, okay. You know, it's got the, you know, the the, the wrap tape. The black stuff. one. What was that black the one? The vaping. Called? Yeah, the vaping. The, red. the vaping. Um, so you you mentioned you taught yourself um, using books like these days, what would you recommend for resources to, to you know, all all those books are still, still totally relevant. Um, yeah, I haven't really seen a lot of great online stuff, but I'm sure there's like YouTube local rod builders too. You could probably hit up and, you know, so I know you, um, you do custom nice. stuff then, right? You'll, mm-hmm. you'll do. What yeah, do you think's missing out there as far as a, a rod that you can't just pick up and order? Because and the one that I'm thinking of is his, you know, his check nymphing the stuff that he does. Um, you know, Echoes making some cool stuff, but I don't know. I feel like I feel like there's a gap somewhere in there, like as far as weighting the rods a special way. And um, I don't know. You see, you see a gap anywhere in there. Not, something not really. I mean, it's pretty crazy. All the different brands nowadays, right. you can pretty much find what you're looking for. Yeah. The only thing that you're going to like find that's, you know, different is either just like 
really high quality stuff, you know, that, that you're going to get from a custom rod builder. I mean, mm-hmm. there's only a handful of guys that are mass producing anywhere close to the custom rod builders. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like basically Berkheimer. Um, some of the Scott ones have really, really nice cosmetics and stuff like that. Um, Sage, they don't really go as deep into the cosmetics. They go in more into like in their technology and their graphite. Yeah. yeah. So they, yeah. they go real heavy into the uh, graphite industry and, and working with their aerospace. I've seen companies. a lot of glass rods being built and yeah. photographed these days. So that's that's like what I tend Blue to build Halo on a lot. Well. Blue Halo is a good company. Mm-hmm. Um, Epic in New Zealand, they're a good company. CTS is who makes the blanks for Epic. They're a really good company. Um, uh, Tom Morgan make some mm-hmm. sick blanks and that's basically uh he was one of the main rod uh designers for uh winston when mm-hmm. they were in san francisco and, and even he was there a little bit for when they had moved to montana too mm-hmm. um and uh you know there's a lot of really cool blank manufacturers it kind of just you can find anything it just depends on what you want you know i, I like a lot of the glass stuff for the smaller creek rods yeah. and and spring creek rods and things like that because you don't need a a 10 foot 11 foot monster rod for doing a small stream you know you kind of want something small and why not make it pretty and cool looking you know i was when i was working at the fly shop I, I, that's kind of where i learned is from all those pal guys and larry bluck at the chico fly shop he's pretty phenomenal rod builder and mm-hmm. um press pal before he passed he he worked with a guy uh, dr dick Cantner, i think was his name guy who developed like the first graphite racket club graphite bicycle you know all this like sure. crazy. he was just in the game yeah and uh so press went to him to design this blank and he does original all blanks are, are kind of wrapped like a cigar right so mm-hmm. you you have this sheet and then they wrap it like a cigar all the way up towards yeah. the tip they roll it up on like a, a toilet mandrel. like a toilet roll or yeah, yeah. okay yep so uh, what these guys did is they took a longitudinal wrap over the outside of that so what it did is just made it incredibly um, durable and strong. We were taking pliers and like trying to crush pieces of this graphite, and I mean mm-hmm. you couldn't even you couldn't even get down on your on it and, and snap it. Yeah. Where all any other company you'd take a do that, it just it crumble like powder. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of cool. That's what we were building on at the end of his days, and mm-hmm. unfortunately it didn't go anywhere. But still really cool blanks. Wow, that's some cool stuff. And. and a lot there's a lot of brands out there that had some really cool stuff that are now defunct you know fisher had some cool Mm -hmm. graphite too Mm -hmm. and um they were doing a lot of the blanks for winston um and a couple other people i think they might have been doing some of the stuff for scott too um and what's crazy is like a lot of those really marquee brands all kind of had bases in san francisco so Hmm. like scott fly rods was based out of sf winston was based out of sf Fenwick was uh, what a bunch of their guys turned into Sage. Um, hmm. So like a bunch of the fly rod guys from Fenwick, um, I think it went to Grizzly, and then it went to making Winslow, and then it went into Sage. Hmm. So a bunch of these guys, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy Green and some other guys, Don Green, all they started sort of left Fenwick to kind of start fly rod only. Mm. And then that eventually kind of merged into Sage over the course of 30 some odd years. As simple as logistics, getting the graphite from China or overseas, you know, right in. But I know they built some of the, you know, cooked some of the. Well, with with them, is they um, they moved up to Seattle because of the aerospace industry. Right. And so uh, the best graphite is is the stuff being made for airplanes. Yeah. So are they manufacturing the graphite in the States? Or is it really just about the R and D of the graphite in the states, and then it and depends then on what company you're talking about. Right. Okay. Know, it all varies. So, like Sage, I'd be willing to bet they're probably getting a lot of their graphite domestically. I know they're rolling it in their factory. They're actually making it into a tube. You know, because it whether, comes in sheets, right? Yeah, exactly. It yeah. comes like a very, very thin paper, and then um, you lay that paper down, and then usually it has like a layer of super thin coating of glue on the top of the paper so when they roll it there's a sort of glue layer in between the layers of graphite as it's rolling on and then when they they put it in an oven and they cook it they cure and that yeah that glue hardens and then solidifies kind of like an epoxy it's like it's like Mm. basically like mixing the epoxy to where it like hardens and then it, it it hardens but it still stays flexible and so um 
uh, once they've cooked it, and then it kind of like sets and holds that shape. Hmm. It'd be cool to, uh, we need to hit up some of those guys and just go get a tour, a tour of the plant. That'd be yeah. kind of neat. It's so, fun. Yeah. Have you done did that the before? Same, did the Sims really one this cool. year too. Yeah. We need to do a How It's Made. Maybe we need to do a How, a how It's How Made, it's made. Uh, TV show. Yeah. yeah. For that. That'd be, That'd be cool. rad. <laughs> Surprise one. They, they haven't done that. You know, I guess that's some of their intellectual I wouldn't, property. I wouldn't though. be surprised if they hadn't, uh, you know, uh, it, whether it would be with them or maybe like G Loomis yeah. or somebody like that. I'd be willing to bet they've probably done a How It's Made with one of those um, Northwest yeah, you know, in fishing rod manufacturers. You've seen like that that Sims video where they sh- show how they make their waders. Sure, it's a killer video. Yeah, such a great video. No, the, the factory in uh, Bozeman. Uh, Bozeman is pretty mm-hmm. awesome. You go through there and they you can take a tour. You just go in there mm-hmm. and they and you like walk through and they'll show this is how we check for leaks on returned waders. This is how we like you know attach the fabric and do like the the seam sealing and you just go through all the different stations. They'll give you a tour. It's pretty cool. Right. Sure. So Dan, um, if the the folks that maybe don't want to build their own rods, but maybe want to get a rod from you, where can they buy from you, or can they? Um, yeah, it's pretty easy, man. Just they just got to hit me up online. So um, I have a, a website, uh, danlecountflyfishing.com. They can hit me up on Facebook, you know, pretty just my name, or um, you know, any of the other avenues. Cool. You know? um, I got a blog out there, rustyhooks.wordpress. Um, but probably the website probably be the okay, best. Okay, cool. Well, well, speaking about the blog, um, you, you're not you're a published author also. So um, one, I want to you know, one of the guys that I think is so one of the a good a, a good writer up in this area is, is uh, um, Bayaki John. Um, he said he just he read a lot when he was a kid. Like what what how do how do you think you got to where you're at level wise for for just writing did, did you read a lot same sort well? of thing yeah, yeah. like I, I used to read a lot of like sci-fi and all that sort yeah. of stuff when i was a kid you know asimov or whatever you know mm-hmm. when i was like 12 and 13 and, and then you read all the stuff we had to do for high school you know steinbeck or whatever and then um so i, I liked reading as a kid my dad was uh, an english teacher and an author and mm-hmm. so kind of definitely went along with the you know family history and stuff um so reading and writing is always pretty big in my family. And then um, what, what books do you, you have out? Um, so I've never really published my own books. I've done a lot of articles for people, for oh, magazines okay. and for blogs and cool. things like that. So, um, you know, California Fly Fisher, Sierra mm-hmm. Sun, Tahoe World, all that sort of local, you know, stuff. Um, I haven't done any um, submissions to, to f- you know, fly fishermen or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I've thought about doing it, though. I've put together things just need to go out there and do it and then um the the photography that was that more out of necessity because of the blog or is out of necessity out of guiding man right yeah so yeah. like you're taking people out and taking them on adventures and and trying to create these cool fishing experiences if you can take some good pictures to send them home with they just have these greater and crisper memories, you know, they're just like, Oh yeah. man, look how cool that sunset was when we were leaving yeah. or look at, you know, how cool that fish looked like up close or whatever. Yeah. So you're always kind of trying to capture as many moments as you can without making it, you know, to where you're doing a photo, a photo shoot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to definitely spend the vast majority of your time working with them, teaching them, sharing with them. And then sneaking in some photographs. Right. And then so when, when you take, when you're out there with a client, like what are you just, are you shooting off your phone or do you take a, something a little more? I've done both. I've done yeah. both, but more and more I just start doing the phone. Yeah. You know, Cause the, the optics the, are getting so dude, good. Dude. Yeah. They're getting so yeah. good with the phones and more and more of the phones are totally waterproof where you can get yeah. the waterproof cases and stuff. So it's not a big deal to carry the, just the phone with you mm-hmm. in your pocket. Um, it is really nice if you can get a good uh, DSLR or a DLSR or yeah. whatever and uh, be able to shoot with like a full-size camera because you can do different things that you can't do with the phone, particularly depth of field stuff. Yeah. You know, zooming. Yeah, like and, and Yeah. There's lots of things you can do with a big camera that you can't yeah. quite do the, with the phone. The, but the, f- the optics on the um, iPhone ten and the iPhone um, eight they they kind of mimic a depth of field effect. Yeah. But you're right in terms of like – not being able to really control what that depth of field is. It's, yeah. a, it's kind of there's a, There's a so much more control and different yeah. things you can do with their full-size camera. But 
like the newer phones are pretty ridiculous. So most yeah. of the time, actually, nowadays, I just actually just carry a phone in my pocket. Yeah. It's so much easier than carrying this backpack with this camera yeah. and all the lenses and all that sort of stuff. Just having a phone in your pocket so much more easy and efficient. Yeah, we did an episode with uh, Greg Greg Kennedy from the Kennedy Brothers. Sure. Um, he, I forget, they could carry, I think he said a Sony. So he actually has, he, he's got a camera. It's not a full body camera, mm-hmm. but it, it, it's a happy medium between, you know, a phone and then, you know, a higher end DSLR. Sure. Uh, I, I, and I did the, that for a long time. I had a, a Nikon that had like a 21 like X like zoom point and shoot. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was just like a, an advanced yeah. point and shoot, but it was a lot smaller. Yeah. You know, it's kind of that sort of medium sort of size and you could just put it in like a little tiny waterproof case, like a little pack and you could throw that in your backpack or your vest or whatever. And uh, it kind of gave you a lot more potential as far as some of the things you could do with it. This is a sweet looking fish on the on the front page of your website. No, oh, thanks, man. The white fin. Is that Trucky? Um, let me see. Trucky fish. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. I think that's the, those are the coolest shots. The like entomology, you know, macro shots mm-hmm. of bugs. Yeah. Super Close cool. up shots of fins, the fish. Fins, Details cheeks, of like the scales eyes. and colors. Oh, yeah, that's I like. Yeah, that a lot of that stuff kind of. Um, you, you know, able. you can kind of marvel at the beauty of nature, right. you know, and yeah. that stuff is, you know, you can really crack out on. You're just like, oh, dude, <laughs> that looks rad, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, a lot of that stuff, people really get stoked on You get to too. the point where you can almost tell, like, oh, that fish is from the Trinity or that fish is oh, yeah. right from the if coast. If somebody t- that- takes photographs of a fish from our, my region, probably about 98% of the time, you I can guess just at. by looking at the fish yeah. where he caught it, you and know, cause they all the look really is. unique. Yeah. <laughs> so our That's river, Bob. Oh, there's yeah. Bob. <laughs> our river is like the fish look totally different depending on where you get it from. So if you get a right. fish from the uh. Truckee and it's a wild fish, it looks totally different than if it's a fish from the fly casters. Right. It looks totally different than if it's a fish from little Truckee. It looks totally different if it's a fish from a Creek or if it's from Sage lake. Hen or whatever. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or if it's from a lake, they all look totally unique. It's pretty wild, hmm. you know, cause just the diets are different. Their environment's different. And it changes the fish, this appearance completely. And then I saw on your website, you, you do art also. I didn't, there wasn't much detail on it, but what kind of, what kind of art are you into? Uh, you know, lots of little things, you know, like I, I drew some of the, the, the icons for my logo on my, uh, on my business card and stuff. And, and, um, lots of little stuff like that, you know, I'll do different kinds of drawings and, and scribings of things and, and just building like the fly rods. A lot yeah, of times I'll say, like do the like, calligraphy and scribing yeah. on the rod myself with my and own. Even the craftsmanship behind the rod itself yeah. and the flies for that matter. What is, kind of pin yeah. do you use for that? Um, so I have like a, a gel, gel. A, no, no, I have like a, a classic India ink sort of style pen. Okay. And so I'll actually, you know, the, the full on dip, dip it in, in the it? ink. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. Oh, wow. And then you let it kind of set and then you write on it. It's very Indian. And it then you get pissed because it's not written right and you wipe it off yep. and then you do and do it again. It takes you like 10 times before you kind of get it to where it like looks just right. Building an art uh, yeah. rod is easy, but drawing on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard because it's, you're not drawing on something flat. Right. You're, it's rounded. So right. it's really easy to screw up the way, you yeah. know, the, the contact of the pen to the surface. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're not drawing on something flat, when, you, when it's curved, it kind of changes everything the way you scribe it. You couldn't like write it on transfer paper or something and then push it in. I'm sure you know, that's probably what a lot of the like yeah. rod companies do yeah, is right. they silk screen it. You know, they just, yeah. they put it over and they whoosh, whoosh, swipe it. And that way they don't have to have somebody to scribe it. But, yeah. um, a lot of the companies still do somebody like Scott still, they still yeah. have somebody that they have a chick, this lady that, uh, she does it every single rod. She scribes the, the words on it. That's what her job is. Um, you know, um, I think a couple other guys still do a lot of the scribing too for some of the big companies. If you, um, I, I'm going to ask you guys both this question cause I know pal's famous for it. Have you done any split, split cane stuff? Um, you first. That's it? forty hours to just build the freaking blank. What? Yeah. yeah. So no, <laughs> I haven't. But I've seen you it. Guys, done it came out of your shop though, right? Y- yeah. Guys, yeah. Yeah. The there's only one guy. Gene Pal is still doing it here locally, and I think there's a gap in paradise. But uh, that's a lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah, I haven't split my own cane or any of that sort of stuff. You kind of need like a full wood shop to be able yeah. to, you know, like you need like a good workshop to be able to do all that stuff. To flame your cane, you know, you got to torch it yeah. and get all the moisture out. I've seen a documentary and, on him, like, oh, boy. Yeah. And planing it, all these little things require space, you know. And um, 
So knowledge too of the oh, yeah. tapering and all that you're, you're oh, trying yeah. to create. It, well, have you guys fished those kind of rods before? Oh, Casted. Yeah. I've never yeah. fished one. No, I've fished cane rods Casted. a bunch. And, uh, I've actually built on blanks, you know, that they're cane, but I've never made a cane blank before. I've just oh. built on them, but fished them for sure. They're pretty fun. It, it, it's very similar Whippy to Whippy and heavy, like a glass rod. Yeah, it's like it's like a heavier glass, glass. rod. Yeah, that's okay, good. that's a good analogy. Yeah, I mean, but there are I've thrown ones that are lighter too. Like you get, <clears throat> you go to like the shows, and there'll be a guy that's making like a hollow cane rod where Whoa. they basically they like they cut a lot of the inside of the six yeah. split you know pieces and line them up so it's actually like a hollow like a graphite rod. So it cuts a lot of the weight out and it's, it's super lightweight and it, 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 they're crisp, man. They're really fine. That's like next level carpentry though. Yeah. It's pretty gnarly because they're trying to line up all those little inside, you know, yeah. thicknesses to the exact same of these six different strips. Yeah. And so it's a lot of work and a lot of very fine detail. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that's th- why those rods cost like two grand. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming down here. I know it's quite a bit of, you know, round trip for you is not, not a, a short trip. Um, before we cut you loose. I'd say we should go get a beer, but you guys are both sick. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. Get everybody sick in the bar. Um, so how, the first thing is like, how can people book a trip with you? And then where can we find you online and social and all that stuff? Sure. Um, same thing, you know, the website, uh, Dan LeCount flyfishing.com. Um, and uh, they can hit me up on Facebook, you know, again, Dan LeCount. Um, and, um, uh, you can contact me with my phone number, probably just best to just look at my, uh, website for that rather than just saying it online. Yeah. Five, three, Oh, four, four, eight, nine, two, six, five sure, sure. for all your yeah, stalkers. It's, it's, it's a podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's a podcast. It's not like this is going out for, uh, for everybody, huh? So just text them some junk pictures. Yeah. Send me a bunch of dick pics. You know, that's great. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, that'll be like the, as far as the contact that works great, you know, um, and so they can hit me up on that. Um, what was the other question besides the contact? Just social media and stuff. Oh, like yeah. Instagram, all that. Yeah. Oh, the same thing on, on Instagram. Yeah. Dan LeCount Fly Fishing. Um, so I'm on that. And then um, got the blog. It's rustyhooks.wordpress. Um, I'm not as active on the blog anymore. So much of my content just ends up going thrown on Instagram nowadays. I need to write more on the blog every now and then. It's pretty fun, you know, but I just haven't been using that outlet as much as I used to. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work, man. Yeah, it, it it's fun because you can just, you know, nerd out and write, you know, a few paragraphs if you have a cool adventure you want to mm-hmm. share. Like there's certain definitely avenues where it is still a real good medium. Um, but more and more, you know, it's just about that quick little blurb, yep. you know, Hey, we had a fun day, you know, catching fish on betas today and a couple of pictures. I, do you, do you follow Mike Anderson out of the Reno fly shop? Yeah, for sure. So I like what he does with, he does his, his vlogs. So uh-huh. he'll do those on the he water. He does the pyramid lake video. Yeah, vlog. Man, I think if you're a guide, you should be doing that. It's, yeah. it's easy to do and it's, it's, uh, it, it gets a lot of value for the person that's watching it, but it's also easy for you. You don't have to sit down at your desk and bang out a blog. Sure. You know? Yeah, it definitely makes sense. They're you cool. know, if, uh, especially with like a place like pyramid or whatever, cause the conditions can make such a big difference yeah. as far as catching fish out there. If you go out there and like the beginning of the season, you're just like, yeah, the fish are all in like a hundred feet of water. You know, you can maybe mm. catch some fish first thing in the morning um on a down but it's going to be tough yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then you go oh yeah it's it's you know midweek of march the fish are everywhere you know just find some open beach and you're going to find them you know it's really nice with there because conditions can really make a big difference as far yeah. as catching fish there yeah i haven't nice. fished the i haven't fished pyramid yet dude you got them man it's i mean if you're not catching fish out there it's like watching paint dry if you are catching fish out there, it is insane. Mm-hmm. And even then, like it can have a real fun social, you know, scene with it, you know, especially if you go up with a bunch of buddies, mm-hmm. um, you, you get some buddies up there, up there, you got a couple six packs in the back of the truck while you're BSing, you know, maybe somebody has got a grill and you're barbecuing some, you and know, you, cheese steaks or something. You hear the bell go off and you yeah. just run up to your, your spinner. <laughs> <laughs> it can be fun, man. It can be fun. Um, it's just a different atmosphere. It, it is. It definitely has. It's so unique at Pyramid, and you know, it's fun, yeah. you know. But uh, if the fishing's really slow, 
you're, it's kind of like fishing on the moon. You know, mm-hmm. there, there's no trees, there's no plants, really. It's such a trippy yeah. fishery. You know, it's so unique. It's yeah. so unique, but it, you know, it could be really fun, man. Yeah. You know, cool. It's a good analogy. Fishing on the moon. Yeah. I like yeah. It. All right. Well, thanks again for coming. Yeah. Appreciate thanks for it. having me, man. This is awesome. Yeah. Come down and uh, fish with us when you have some have some time. Yeah, right? absolutely. You should go float the sack or something, man. There you go. That'd be cool. Yeah. If you guys get up to Truckee, man, we'll go. Uh, we'll go hit some. For cool. sure. I'll uh, I'll I'll hit you up now that I have your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks for listening. Thanks, we'll thanks, have Dan. another one next thanks, week. Guys. Boop. This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amped Up Bill. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vienchen, Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.build.